Thank you. All right, we're going to call the meeting to order. 3.33? Yes. 3.33. Yes, here. Steve Owen? Here. Sherry Barron? Here. Renee froze. Turn your camera off, then on again, Renee. Mike. Renee, you froze for a second there. Try that again. No, try it again. Oh, sorry. How's that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. Bob Clark? Yep. yep. Sarah Gracia? Here. Laura Ramston? Here. Will Sankowitz? Here. Steve Sylvia? Here. Good. Okay. <laughs> So we are recording this meeting. Um, thanks to Steve Owen having a conversation with Renee. We should be recording them anyway. It certainly is a great way to have a thorough record and it helps her negotiate the whole Zoom, the virtual meeting technology. So we are recording, which means we're going to do voice votes and we're gonna ask people to say their names when they speak. I see that Jose's here with his hand up. Can we, can we please record this meeting? Can Lake Cam record it? Yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> we are recording it. Lake Cam is recording, correct? Yeah, we need permission. Okay. Can you do that, Renee? Granted. Yes. Yeah, it's all set. Thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, so remember to say your name when you're speaking, and we're going to do the, the voice vote thing. Um, Anyone else recording? All right. Um, is there anyone here for public participation? In the waiting room? No, I don't see any hands. You don't see any hands? Okay, thank you. All right. We have minutes from the 8th and the 9th of April. Um, we need to vote to accept or not or modify. You want to handle them both together, Jean, or something? Um, actually, I think they should be separate in this case. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes from April 8th. Thanks. Is there a second? Second. Excellent. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Okay, aye. Renee. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Let's call the names, Renee. Jean Fox? Yes. Steve Owen? Yes. Terry Barron? Yes. Bob Clark? Yes. Derek Gracia? Yes. Laura Ramston? Yes. Will Sankowitz? Yes. Steve Sylvia? Yes. Right. And just for clarity, Steve Owen made the motion and Sherry Barron seconded. Barron seconded. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Steve. All right. Um, on, on the um, 9th, April 9th, do you have a motion? So no. I'll make a motion. To accept April 9th minutes. Okay, Steve Owen made a motion. Second. And Will Sankowitz made a second on the April 9th minutes. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We'll do the names. Jean Fox? Yes. Steve Owen? Yes. Sherry Barron? Yes. Bob Clark? Yes. Eric Gracia? Yes. Laura Ramston? Yes. Will Sankowitz? Yes. Steve Sylvia? Yes. Great. Um, so there are no presentations to the school committee, correct, Rick? That's just a placeholder? That is correct, Mr. Fox, but we do have some breaking news. There you go. Okay. At our next meeting, <laughs> Mr. Pacheco, uh, Robert Pacheco will be joining us to give a, a high school update at May on the May 13th and on the May 27th we'll have our top 10 presentations, Zoom uh, yep. style. So at least okay. we don't have presentations for this session, but for the next two subsequent meetings, we'll have, um, we'll have, some, we'll have some nice um, high school faces in front of us. Lovely. That's thank you. All right, well, thank you. Old business, we go to Ashley on the FY20 budget report. Hi everyone, in your packet, you have an updated FY20 budget presentation like we have in our previous meetings. 
Um, right now, I'm going through our budget to determine where we have surpluses for FY20 and where we can either um, ha allocate that money to certain um, projects for the rest of this year or where we're going to have savings that will be going into E&D as we close out the school year. So that's ongoing, and I will keep you updated as I go through that information. Do you expect any savings? I do. Uh, for instance, for substitutes, um, we oh. haven't gone through the last few months, the last quarter, so we should have a savings there. Um, we're still in negotiations with our bus contract, so there will most likely be savings there as well. Right. Jean? Yes. Yes, Derek. Derek Gr oh. Gracious talking. Can I ask a question? Um, Ashley, isn't there going to be savings related to things like sports where we don't have referees or transportation in those areas as well? So those are in the revolving account. Um, transportation and the referees are paid out of there. Where we will see savings is on the spring coaches because those stipends are not being paid this year. Um, but there's also a loss of revenue because there are no spring payments. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the other question I have is: There been any discussion with the towns in relation to that? Um, you know, we're gonna. There's gonna be some devastation when it comes to finances. I would imagine down to the towns, but we haven't seen what a stimulus is gonna look like for towns or city governments at this point. But I'm assuming it's it, you know it's gonna be tough. So has there been any discussion and coordination with the towns of how the savings may affect our budget going into next year? So I haven't heard from the towns, um, but I have been watching their board of selectmen meetings um, and kind of monitoring their conversations regarding FY21. Um, they haven't indicated making any reductions in budgets at this point. I'm sure it's coming, but I think everyone's just kind of holding where we are and waiting for more information for the, from the state. For instance, we kicked off this week, which I'll talk about a little bit more in my next report, um, a 112th budget process yes. for regional schools. And that's something we're going to have to go through because our town meetings are, are scheduled to be so late in June. Yes. So I haven't heard anything about um, aid to municipalities yet. Just saying. I'm sorry, Rick. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so just to add to what Ashley said, so when she talks about FY21, some of the topics that you've hit upon will be rolled into that 112th discussion. Uh, as you know, they Lakeville and uh, Freetown have rescheduled tentatively their town meetings for late June and even at a real question mark, right? So we have a process that we have in place that will impact and, and have it. But to, to, to one point that Ashley shared that I think one board member asked me, um, appointment letters did not go out for spring sports in any event that would have that didn't start. We held off on those appointment letters. We were waiting to see what the school closure would be. And, and this week, the athletic director is sending notice out to the coaches relative to those stipends not being covered. Um, and, and there'll be some more details to follow. But right now, we're, we're on target for FY20, as Ashley shared. Um, and we're, and uh, the negotiation of transportation is going to be an interesting piece in the next week or so coming out and then obviously revolving accounts and refunds going back and forth. And, uh, but Ashley's right on top of that. And I think some of the conversation um, will roll into the FY21 when we get to new business. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Steve yes, Owen. Steve Owen. Yep. If there is a way I'd like to, for us to see us categorize these savings um, that are related to the current situation versus overall saving. Because uh, I would imagine FY21 is going to be a very difficult year. One, not knowing what the state is going to do. Um, so there may be some challenges that we as the district are going to face. And I'd like to, as we partner with the towns, here are the savings that we had, but there's definitely going to be some um, non-savings in the coming year as a result of what we're going through now. So I, I think that would be a healthy part of the conversations, especially with the towns uh, and what, if anything, we get from the state. Yeah, no, you make a good point. We, it would be nice to isolate the COVID-19 from anything else. I think that's a great idea. Um, um, all right, so thank you for that discussion, Ashley. And now we go to the superintendent on the revised calendar for school year. Yeah, so this is going to be pretty straightforward and we'll roll into new business. We've mm -hmm. obviously made the adjustment on the revised calendar to reflect that we're not returning to school. The last school day is now June 25th and we have um, 41 uh, days of remote learning 
with some real enhanced guidance from the state. And Pat has a detailed report coming up, not only in addition to what you have in your packets, but on top of that. And uh, I'm pretty excited about the next eight to nine weeks, but we did adjust the calendar. I, I don't think it comes as a, any surprise to anybody relative to that. Um, it does curtail all campus activities. Um, I did share with you, it's not out yet, but you do know there's some events scheduled, graduation and some, some alternative dates. Uh, seniors are, good, are gonna be receiving that information um, Thursday or Friday of this week. So unfortunately we can't have a, 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 I request respectfully that we hold off on conversations relative to those options. But I wanted to give you some insight into some creative ideas that I think uh, will be well received. But calendar does not need formal action. It simply just reflects the fact that we're in remote learning mode for the rest of this year. And let's be perfectly honest, we are preparing, anticipating maybe uh, fall, whether it be a hybrid or mount, and, and so I can, I'll speak a little bit to that later. But under old business, unless people have questions, we simply just made that revision relative to the colors in the calendar. Thank you. Last school day now, June 25th. Thank you. So new business, if there's nothing else, we'll roll into our coronavirus update under new business, and that goes back to you again, Mr. Madeira. Sure. Mrs. Fox, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be brief here because the director's reports really reflect a whole lot of detail relative to instruction and curriculum and those enhanced plans and, and special education and business. But what I want to do is just give some highlights. I, I shared a reflection with you from the superintendent, from the executive director of Mass Association today. I thought which actually ref, accurately reflects kind of the work that we're all doing and, and, and the stress that everybody's facing and in the world we're in. And, uh, but I'm real encouraged by what, what we've had to date. We have, we have served 827 meals. We're going to continue with meals. We've actually coordinated with some messages through the chair here, Mrs. Fox, to get some information out relative to other options families have in both Lakeville and Freetown. We've disseminated or distributed 210 Chromebooks. I've shared with you kind of this four phase, consistent with what the state's doing process that my leadership team's under, right? We're in the process of completing that first phase, which is when the governor closed schools through May 4th. Mm -hmm. The next phase, phase two, the one we're really starting to, to grasp now is are those 40 days of remote learning, the enhanced guidance, the end of the year activities, the final reports, the professional development, and we're right on target relative to the next two months. You're going to hear some exciting information coming out through some of the directors relative to that. And then the third phase is summer programming, right? What does our extended school year program look like for special education students? Will it need to be remote? We are planning an extended summer program. Liz will speak to that either way, but it may be unfortunately remote virtual um, we're looking at holding off potentially. We've got to make decisions on Kids Cafe, on, on our campus programs. For example, Stonehill has already canceled all campus programs. So our students who, and we always have a good, a, a decent contingent that go to Stonehill for PCC, that that program has already been canceled for the summer. And I anticipate it's the first of many programs that are gonna, that are gonna go by the boards relative to, to, to summer. And then lastly, phase four, is looking at what the fall looks like and right the new normal and and so I just wanted the committee to hear and let and share with you and I kind of shared it with you in a very brief summary. Phase two is kind of what we're kicking into now, right? That phase that we spent those four or five weeks of remote learning. Now that we know we're in, in it for the long haul, what assessment looks like, what instruction looks like, the attention to detail, and, and I'm real pleased about that. Oh, by the way, school choice deadline is this week and. Um, we're in the process of trying to fill those 25 slots, mostly at the secondary level, middle school and high school. We have filled a little more than half right now, uh, and those letters will, acceptance will be going out next week. We did get some additional enrollment I want to share with you relative to this, right, with the Coil Cassidy announcing that they're shutting down. We're seeing a few more students come back to us there. Uh, not only our students, but students from Taunton and other areas who are looking to school choice for us, which helps. And we'll be talking about the old colony topic a little bit later. Uh, where we're going to see a significant enrollment piece there. But I'd be happy to answer specific questions. Leadership team met today relative to the calendar as a whole. 
Um, and, and and yet there are going to be a lot of, I know, instructional questions that will come out when Pat and, and Liz and, and Ashley speak to some of the details. So I'm going to hold okay. off on that because because uh, Pat okay. has worked real closely with the principals to 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 roll out some things that are exciting. But I'll, I'll stop there, Gene. Thanks. Yep, I'll be happy to answer specific thank questions. You Steve, Steve Owen has his hand up. Um, thank you for the outline of the phase uh, approach. I think that's smart. Is, so two questions for you. Is there a timetable for the decision on um, summer programming, in particular Kids Cafe? And the reason why I bring that up, a lot of people look forward to that for uh, daycare options. Right. So I, I'd yep. like to see us make a decision sooner Good. rather than later so that way they can plan accordingly. Yep. Steve, great, great question. Had a conversation with Lisa Pacheco just yesterday because some of you may know the Cathedral Camp in town just had, has canceled their summer program. Um, so we, we looked at May 13th, which is our next school committee meeting, as a time frame that we thought was reasonable. It hopefully allows us to have a little bit more perspective. The problem with the May 13th time frame, it's timely to Steve, to your point on daycare, but it still doesn't fall within the the closure date that the governor now has extended to May 18th. Mm -hmm. um, so I think somewhere between May 13th and June 1st, we have to make a decision. So families have at least a month's time to prepare um, for those programs. And, and that's where I'm, where I'm looking at right now. Okay. My second question, I can't help but wonder at the, the start of the school year in that phase um, is going to potentially have some e impact to the budget. So is there a, a part of this phased approach, some strategies around if we have to make some changes to accommodate the changes in the budget, right? Yep. Uh, I know contractually there's some dates we need to look at, uh, what have you. So I'm concerned that the revenue sources, AKA the state, what have you, are going to be drastically reduced. And I feel like we're going to have stronger need for services that our budget won't be able to handle currently. So, so we are looking at priorities, Steve, relative to the use of technology devices, for example. And, um, and we absolutely have to capture that because there may be some adjustments that need to be made. That's why I really didn't want to speak too much to the calendar in detail because things could change. But Ashley's aware of that and uh, great, great topic, and, and it's something we're prioritizing relative to where we may have to put some monies forward to make some adjustments to address remote learning, for example, uh, in a more comprehensive nature and maybe more one-to-one -one type of device potential usage, for example, which obviously has budget implications. Yeah, there's just uh, something to keep in mind across the board. I think there's going to be some changes yeah. that are going to be made, both positive and negative, unfortunately, that we need to look at as a whole. I don't, I don't know if other board members have questions. I did have, Steve did ask me a question. Our one call system, communication system yeah. does allow me to determine whether families have been notified. Um, and the, the one complexity is we don't get a, an idea to see if they've actually read the emails. It just simply says receive, Steve. You had asked that question. Um, we're researching a little bit more, getting specific data, but the communication tool seems to be working, but we don't have data that drills down to, to determine to the extent by which um, people are reviewing that documentation. But stay tuned, I'll, I'll try to get some more information relative to both the emails and the phone calls that are going home. Got it. I'll be happy to answer any other questions, Mrs. Fox. I think, and I don't see anybody, I'm, I guess I'm looking back at Ashley Lopes for the FY21 budget now, thank you. Yeah, it's coming, it's gonna roll right in. Yep. So in your packet, I've included a few documents. The first one is my report and it's just an overview. It includes what you voted for the FY21 budget as it stands today. And then the second part of that goes into the discussion about a 112 budget. Yes. As I mentioned earlier, we kicked off those conversations this week with the state. Um, they've had to do this before with other regional districts. It's just most likely going to be every single regional district this year. Um, with that being said, the state's still working on it and there's a bunch of questions that are out there that they're getting back to regions um, with answers. And then they're also hoping to put together a document to make it a more streamlined process for us. Because as I highlighted in your packet, there are a lot of requirements that they're asking, but they need this detail to be able to approve a 112 budget. So does everybody just, I don't want to belabor that point, Ashley, you could speak to it, you put it in your packet. 
we're basically we're, we're looking at dollar amounts based on one twelfth of last year's mm -hmm. budget moving forward and making sure that we can meet all our obligations relative to that. Um, we believe that based on our initial reviews, unlike some districts that are making massive layoffs and so forth, we're able to hold off on some positions and postings and we're in the process of reviewing that right now. So I do not anticipate needing to do that based on our current numbers. And hopefully we're not in a 112 budget for a lengthy period of time. Um, but, but obviously we're preparing for that, Ashley. I don't know if you want to speak to that in more detail. And for the 112 process, I'll have to go through the process of preparing all this information yeah. because the town meetings are late. They're scheduled to be late. Um, but if, let's say they do go off on June 20th and June 22nd, Freetown and Lakeville, both, both budgets, we can start with our full year budget. We just have to wait and see kind of at that point. Yeah, well, we have a history, you know, we've, we've prepared for the 112 scenarios in the past. Bob Clark will remember that. Um, in fact, I'm, Sherry, you probably remember too, that we've been in that position. It is not something you want to be in for a long time. It's, it's not a fun place to be. So, um, so, the, so the two towns have identified dates. Their concern, obviously, is the current guidelines relative yes. to social distancing and, and being able to accomplish that. I think right now, uh, truth be told, I shared it with both town administrators. I think it's fairly challenging. Even They're both, by the way, planning to use our campus site, um, but that short of an outside venue for these meetings, it will be real challenging to get people to line up to do what you need to do and accomplish that. Although I do know in at least conversation with one of the towns, they're hoping the state may, re may reduce some of their quorum um, requirements and so forth. So, um, Obviously, best case scenario, those town meetings go forward and get our budget approved, but we're, uh, as Ashley pointed out, required to move forward with the 112th and we'll be prepared for both. Okay, that's has. great. Any questions for Ashley? So Ashley, do you want to speak to, not to put, um, put you on the spot, but we are, for example, I don't want to go down the topic for a lengthy period of time, but don't forget we have a transportation fund available. If we have transportation fund sa savings that can be used, that all of that can be looked at. Uh, even if it's a small piece. Right. So right now we're in negotiations with first student. Every um, school district in the state who uses first student, we've come together to have conversations with them. So there'll most likely be a reduction in our contractual agreement there. So we should have excess funds in that account at the end of the year. With the revenue that comes in, as you voted earlier this school year for the transportation revolving account, we can move that revenue revenue into that account and use it in FY21. And, 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 the, and the important piece to that, unlike when we originally have that conversation, is if, if there are reductions in revenue, whether it be local or state, it can offset some of that and still carry our FY21 budget in a decent shape. Again, it kind of to be determined though, right? We're still looking at those calculations. We've paid our transportation uh, obligations up through the month of March. We're speaking specifically about April, uh, May, and June. Thank you, Ashley. All right. Um, so you're going to go in now, I guess, to more detail on the summer programming at this point? So, yeah, I saw the, so the summer programming, again, we've kind of captured that a little bit because it is such an important topic. I think Steve referenced it. Um, PCC was can, you know, canceled for those students, primarily Lakeville. They're getting refunded. Uh, we are looking at campus programs, Kids Cafe. I want to make sure I clarify, though, because there have been sp some special education parents, and, and Liz has been in contact with them. If, in fact, we don't have campus programs and athletics and those types of springs, the, the summer sports, and or the Kids Cafe because of state guidelines, we still intend to have an extended school year program for our special education students ideally obviously on campus or in the schools, but remote. So I don't want, I want to be clear here that ESY program will exist for our students um, in some form, whether it be hybrid, solely remote, or, uh, you know, as business as usual. I think the challenge is gonna be, let's, and I'm trying to prepare parents in Freetown and Lakeville for the expectation that I think it's gonna be well out of our our call relative to the kids cafe having 300 400 kids on campus and in close i i don't see how those guidelines are going to open up that quickly no. for july you know july 5th july 6th so I, i'm just preparing because unfortunately as many of you know our parents and people 
may, as we go through the various phases, be returning to work and then yet have some restrictions relative to, to help, you know, daycare for kids, which is going to be a challenge. But we will hopefully between May 13th and June 1st have that information and I'll continue to keep you updated. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Steve Owen. Um, just related to that, I, I hope that the district makes the decision and, and not wait for the state guidance. You know, as you, as you look here, the governor just announced yesterday, about a, one, less than one week before we're supposed to go back, that is extended two weeks. Uh, I would even argue as a parent, waiting till June 1st is very late in the game, right? Mm -hmm. Especially those with younger children, uh, it's, it's gonna be difficult and everyone's gonna be fighting this, don't get me wrong, it's not just to our district, but if, if there are concerns across the board and we don't feel that we can mitigate that, I hope we can make a decision sooner rather than later. But I totally understand and respect that it comes from your office. I just would like us to not to wait for the governor's guidance because it seems to be later and- Yeah, what? he's he's a little bit last minute. He is, yeah, uh, Gracia. Yeah, I, Steve, I, I'm a little confused because us announcing any sooner than the state isn't going to really matter because those parents aren't going to have another choice anyway because those businesses are all going to be closed so why wouldn't we just wait for the state because they're not going to have any other option I, I, if, I, go ahead just, just why not make a decision right if we don't feel that we can do that why not give them enough information to go on they can definitely look at other options. There may be businesses that are closed, but they need to look at other options outside of the district of finding their daycare services. This is a big thing for parents in this district. So yeah, it's I a do, big thing I'd for be parents. Of waiting for the state to provide guidance if we can provide guidance sooner rather than later. That is well, all. But that state guidance also includes what daycares will be open to parents. Yeah. So that they will be incrementally introduced as well. That's where the state guidance is helpful. Yes, Derek Gracia. Um, yeah, so, so I hear Steve's point. My concern would be, my concern would be, we say we're not opening and then the state comes back afterwards and says we can open. And, and yeah. what would we do then? The, the, that would be a mistake, I think. So I'd be concerned that we make the wrong decision. And, you know, this is such a fluid situation and it changes I, daily. That I, I think, know, can I may, Mrs. Fox? Yes. I know Mr. Sylvia had his hand up too. I just wanted to add the May 13th timeframe is a week before the governor's this most recent closure. And I think we will have some direction relative to what may be opened up relative to summer camps and daycare, which will provide some guidance and direction. But I do hear loud and clear, people need to know. They do. Steve, Sylvia. Okay, Laura. Yeah, I, I'm not even sure how to frame this question mostly given that I'm not super familiar with the program, but, but in terms of just a flat out cancellation, could you reset or rethink capacity limits based on essential need? I mean, that would be a tough thing to do, but in, in the event of you know, essential workers or, or people needing something, there could be capacity limits set. I'm just, I guess the question is, is that an option to look at it yeah. that way? That would I, really have to look at what the facilities costs are. There'd be a lot. I mean, you know, they, when they introduce, they're going to introduce most likely incrementally, like Rhode Island has expanded from five gatherings of five to gatherings of 10 as they start to reintroduce things. And I don't think that, you know, I just, this pure speculation, that's all any of us can do at this point is try to figure out how they're going to logically reintroduce without reinfecting everybody. And they have, you know, 350 kids in these programs. I don't know about limiting it. I don't know, but it's a good point. It is an excellent point. Yes, Steve, 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 to your point, um, it is absolutely a valid point, and I think we have to consider those options. Maybe multiple sites, um, if yeah. there are some restrictions, can we somehow accommodate some of the need? Um, it's not going to be easy, like you pointed out, but it, it's, it's, not, it, it's on the table right now. I want this group to know that. Good. Laura Ramson. Yeah, my question was regarding the ESY services. Have eligibility determinations already been made for that programming or is that fluid right now? Liz? Liz? She's still mute, Liz. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, Liz? I was trying to You're unmute. Right. So most of those decisions are already made prior to, um, you know, the middle of March when we left. 
So certainly we will be looking at, um, at students' progress over the, the course of that. And this, if there's any other students, we will certainly um, do an amendment meeting to add that. But generally speaking, those are fairly set by the spring because you've looked at regression data from um, the previous summer, um, the Thanksgiving, the winter break, and the February school vacation. So we actually have a lot of data to make those decisions. So luckily, this came you know, in mid-March when we have a, a large chunk of data to look at for the school year. I just want us to be mindful that um, further regression may have happened based on the fact that we've been out and I wanna be sure that we provide those services for everyone who needs them. Certainly, but just to distinguish between, so extended school year is something very different and the need to look at individual students um, to determine whether any additional services are needed um, would be a, a different discussion. Um, they're just two different, um, two different entities entirely. Certainly if we, if we were able, we had come back in June um, we might have used the summer. We're, we're still looking at that. Um, the state guidance thus far has been that when school returns, those determinations should be made for the additional service piece. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, I, I wasn't looking in terms of additional services so much, um, but more so in terms of emerging skills, perhaps, that may have regressed during this time. Right, so that is what the state is calling the, the compensatory service um, is, a, is a little bit negative and, and generally points to some misservice or some kind of um, malfeasance. And in this case, um, this is just the status of, of what we have. So it's really looking at compensatory services. So we don't know how the students will necessarily fare until we, we can you know, actually see them and make those determinations. But yet, to your point, yes, I, I, I don't disagree. Yeah, we need to be thinking about that mm -hmm. because we are all, a lot of us anyway, are a little bit concerned about mm -hmm. progress or lack thereof. Any other, oh, sorry, Steve Owen. Um, I wanna make sure I understand this correctly, going back to the 12th budget. Are we holding off uh, posting any uh, new positions? I know they're not net new until we're in a full budget process, not in a 112 budget process. Is that correct? Good question, Rick. Um, not not necessarily. So yes, we're holding off on postings, but not necessarily until a budget is approved. We, once we make the determination that we we have we can meet all our obligations uh, within a 112th, we can still we will proceed, but we don't necessarily have to wait until. A, a FY21 budget is approved, Steve. Ashley, correct? I agree with that. So I, it, we're not posting anything currently as we wait to see what's gonna happen with the budget. But once we're approved for our 112 budget, we'll at least know what that's going to be month to month. So for instance, um, in month one, if you, you get $500,000 or whatever it may be, if you don't spend that full amount, the rest of it rolls over to the next year and you continue throughout the school year. So once the state approves that 112th, we'll be able to post for our positions if they're needed. Which would be July, you know, July, August. So but we have a time frame. That is last year's budget. So does it even yeah. incorporate any increases? So what do we do about, we already have a contractual obligations on top of last year's budget that we're not going to be able to afford on that 112th budget. So the state wouldn't put us in a position where we wouldn't be able to afford our, con our contractual obligations. So that's all a part of the analysis that I need to provide to the state when we do this. Um, for instance, another example, not just our contractual salary agreements, but for our retirements, for instance, yep. we pay mm -hmm. Bristol County in a lump sum in July because that gives us a discount in the payment and it's a substantial discount. So instead of paying it over the 12 months, like we need to have those conversations mm -hmm. with the state, which is what all of the regionals are doing is, how do you put that money up front in the July 1 12th of the budget and not prorate it throughout the year? And then the big unknown is we don't know what impact this is all having on student services. So I, I'm, I guess I'm concerned going in with the 1 12th with some big unknowns. Uh, I think we all know it's going to happen. We just don't know what the magnitude of that is. So, um, 
But thank you for clarifying that anyways. I'm just, just a big concern that I would have from a budgetary perspective. Derek Gracia. Uh, to piggyback on Steve's comments, one of the concerns I would have, um, and, and Rick, this is for you, is what happens if we go forward with those positions because they are deemed uh, affordable in the 112 budget and then a budget comes out because of the ramifications that we've had that's much different than what anyone can afford. How do we, how are we going to deal with that with new hires? Yeah. So that's, that's part of the, that's part of the total equation, Derek. I mean, you're right. You're spot on. That's things that Ashley and I uh, will take into account with the leadership team and have to you know, make sure that we have that taken into account. And I think we will. I think we will. I think we'll have a much better idea kind of where we're at relative to the state and local. Um, but, but you're right. You're spot on as far as making sure that that's also something that we consider. Yeah. All right. Are we ready to move oh, no, on? Under summer programming. And the only other thing that I was going to talk about, it says oh. it at the very end of the line, it said events. Events. Yeah. But <laughs> I had to share with you early. I got to hold off. So we, some of those events were senior events that were postponed that were rescheduled, but because the seniors aren't, haven't been informed, uh, uh, we, those, are, those will be discussed with Mr. Pacheco on May 13th. And uh, that, that's what that event said situation was um, relative to some rescheduled things and uh, some things I think that are going to be real exciting for the kids that the high school administration's worked hard at. So that's to be Good. determined. Good. And fully understand that. So um, now we're moving on to the revised 2021 school year calendar of September 14. Yeah. So if I had that crystal ball right now, folks, right, I'd be, you know, I don't know what that, I just wanted to share with you that in phase four, where we have students and staff potentially return to school, we, we did have some things that we knew up front. Um, one, we had to address kindergarten screening mm -hmm. because that normally happens in June. And yet many districts, or some districts, I should say, do it in the fall. So we moved that to the fall. We did adjust, uh, Sherry Barron, thank you, uh, an adjustment to the kindergarten start. And uh, we've done that. And both principals are actually really pleased, as are the staff, with that. So what you see in front of you in 2021 doesn't reflect what the new normal is going to be, right? Because we're not quite there yet. But what it does reflect is the additional Patriots holiday on September 14th. So we actually have two Patriots holidays that we had yeah. to build in um, and the kindergarten start. And I think the rest is to be determined, obviously. So I don't need any formal action taken on that at this time. Um, but we had to build in that additional, which pushed our last school day now to June 21st, which seems like so long, you know, it's so, it's so hard to even grasp right now. I've actually had so much of my leadership conversation about focusing on the next two months but before you know it, we are going to have to give some consideration. And I just, I wanted to make people aware of some adjustments we've already made to the 2021 calendar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Questions on the calendar? Steve just Owen? Just a point of order. I just want to make sure that we're consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we made a change to the uh, previous calendar and we had to do a recent vote and to change that. And we're changing the calendar, it looks like near. So I don't have an opinion one way or another. I just like for us to be consistent in how we're going to address changes to the calendar. Yeah, I, I know MAS has an opinion on this, but mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like for us to be consistent. Yeah, but Mrs. I don't think this is an official change. So, okay, Mrs. Fox, that the reason I, Steve, you make a valid point. We need to mm -hmm. be consistent about that. I am not asking for a vote or action being taken. This is really just shown in, in, for presentation at this point. At some future date, we would, we would need to take a vote as we've done previous. Um, this was more informational for you at this time. So this will not be posted to the website? Well, I think it's important that we need to at least get information out. I have not, um, it is not my intent to publicize next year's calendar because I think we could be making changes. Yep. Yeah, um, well, if we're going to publish it to a website, an outside source, then we should vote on it. That's my, as I said, from a consistency perspective. Yeah. This is just informational for us to think about as you guys are going through that. I'm perfectly fine with it. I'd like for us to be consistent, but if we are going to publish it, we should post it to the website. Um, if we're going to publish it, we should vote on it. Sherry. Um, I would tend to agree with Steve on that. The only difference, well, not the only difference, obviously the big question is our new normal, but if we did go back as the old normal, the only difference in this calendar is the 
14th Patriots Day, which has to be voted on by the legislature. And to my knowledge, it has not yet been, has it? No, I don't think it has. I think no, there right. hasn't been formal action taken on that. Correct. Yep. And that really wouldn't affect anything if, if we went to school on the 14th or if it was a holiday, as far as education was concerned, or, or as far as families are concerned, Steve. But based upon the last calendar voted, it is a school day. It is. That's true. Currently, so correct. We are changing that, which I'm in support of, then we need to revote the calendar. I, I, to be I, consistent, I, right? Yeah, so that's I would agree. I wouldn't disagree with that. I would agree. Mrs. Fox, I'll defer to you at this point if we don't no, post I'm, it. I'm totally fine with that. If you are going to post it, I thought it was for information only. So that's my bad. Um, but certainly, Sherry. I think it does give good information to our kindergarten parents. And, and that's true. Parents. That is true, which what wasn't there. So, yeah. So, okay. So we're going to, let's just be clear on the process. We're going to rescind the prior vote first. Why don't we, let's table the vote, allow Rick to get the right thing that we're trying to do. And then we can have a vote on the May 13th. Next meeting. May that's 13th fine with me. Fine. All I was asking that this body be consistent as far yeah. as how we handle changes to the calendar. I don't think we even know what the right approach is. And so I think let's allow the superintendent to find the right approach. By then we should have things baked, not baker, but uh, just to so what the right approach would be and the consistent approach. Well, we could potentially be closer. I I, I'm, that's duly noted and, and agreed. I'll make um, note of that box and Ms. Mr. Owen for May 13th. Thank you. Um, so the Student Opportunity Act is on the agenda next. So I'm going to ask Dr. Gablinski to speak to this. This was a federal um, requirement relative to some funds and, and money. Uh, Pat, uh, provide you a document, kind of an overview. There's an, a more formal document that goes to the state. So Pat, if I'll turn this over to you at this point. Right. So the General Assembly um, asked the Commissioner of Education to create plans um, that talked about uh, achievement gaps with subgroups. And, and the commissioner directed all of the um, districts to create the student opportunity plans and to choose the subgroup that they were going to address. For us at Freetown Lakeville, we chose the, um, our ELL population. Um, we based that on um, a review of our enrollment numbers. Um, we used our home language surveys for that. And, and because of that, the district increased the amount of ELL teachers by one. So that was what we used the roughly $80,000 that they gave us for. And so because we did that, now the, the rest of the plan needed to be developed. Because we received less than $1.5 million, our form is the short form. So what I have here for you is what I developed with Rick on um, how we are going to support having received those funds and um, you know what, what our evidence is going to be based on um, closing gaps for those students. Um, you had already were party to um, an ELL presentation that showed you quite a bit of information about what we're doing, who our population is, how we're addressing that. Um, and so in this form, um, you'll notice that there are in parentheses, there's like um, D, E, B. Those are requirements that um, the Department of Education had already preloaded that they wanted us to include in our document. So I just put those in parentheses so that you would know what we were doing and where that guidance was coming from. And, and to just um, support why we needed a second teacher and, and what that person was doing as far as the instructional piece that they were giving us. Did you need to talk, Rick? Yeah, so I was just going to add, uh, just, just big picture um, for the board. So, so just so everyone's clear, districts were receiving additional federal monies through the state 
and we had to show evidence of where we where we're using that money as it relates to certain priority. We we've identified the priority of EL, um, and that's money that we already have coming in. The requirement originally was a May first deadline, but everything kind of got thrown off with the whole COVID experience, and so. Um, Pat's sharing this with you informationally to give you some time to digest kind of the overview piece and formal action does need to be, we need a formal vote by the school committee right. prior to sending it. They actually haven't even established the deadline right now. It's, I think it's going to be pushed back to June, but we were hoping to have it addressed in May. Well, because we had created the plan quite a while ago based on the April 1 deadline. So, um, we have it ready to go. The only, the only thing that would prevent me from being able to submit this is that we do not have the date that the school committee um, approved the plan. Yep. So that's what we would be waiting for and, and, and that would happen on May 13th. Derek, do you have a question? Uh, I do. What's the strategy to support this position after this funding? Yeah. So, I'm waiting, at, I don't know if Pat, if you wanna jump in. So it is a grant funded position. We do know we have that money carry over. And so it's built in for 21's numbers as well. Right, Ashley and I have had conversations about this. Steve Owen. So it's got a two year plan of funding is what you're telling me, That's right? That's what now. it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But th uh, just to clarify, cause it's not in the document this was already in place for the current year's budget. Yes. FY20's budget, am I correct in that? Yes, we had already received this money, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so the state's requirement was you had to provide evidence as to where yeah, you spent you the money. It. Where you could spend yeah. it so it's forward. not just so in FY21, we spent some of it in FY20. Correct. Oh yeah. Right, because the, the second ELL teacher is already in place, correct? Yes. Okay, so I so I guess that which which I think will be made clear in Ashley's budget, this particular position is offset by a grant that is going to go away in FY22. Am I understanding that correctly? And to to go back on what Derek's question was. So the way when we did FY20, we had a 0.5 ELL teacher in there. Um, but we were able to, with the amount of salary and we had lost the, the person that we had in the district, we were able to get two for the price of one and a half in the budget. So that's what we did going forward. But right now you provide offset to those position uh, with the line item of the grant that's offsetting that. That's for the reading specialists, the ELL positions in the, in the general fund. Okay. Well, we should just make note of that because obviously that's going to be um eighty thousand dollars less that i know it's a small change in our size of a budget but it is a well, no, an no. Issue that we've had a theme overall that we we fund a position that eventually these grants go away they do agreed agreed and when we move stuff between the grant and in the general fund i normally highlight that and we in the last budget that i've done we have not done that so okay great thank you Derek has a question. Okay, Derek Brescia. Uh Steve, uh, well, the rest of the committee, the inherent problem here is by the time that money goes away, we're going to have an ELL population that's going to probably need that position. Yep. Right? So, you know, this is where the, the, the pot only has so much money, but we have the need. So um, it's going to be, uh, that's the challenge that, that faces us all the time. Um, it's nice that we get the alleviate, the, the help now and that aid now, we're going to need it later and that aid's going to be gone. So it's going to be interesting. That all. You're absolutely right. That's, this is a growing population. It's an upward trajectory and it's not going to turn around. Steve Owen. It, it's a valid point, Derek. I think it was just highlighting that we uh, in this committee, and it sounds like you're furthering to commit to this committee, including the regional FinCom, that of giving the information to the town so it doesn't appear as a new position right. it's just a position that is no longer funded by a grant but now has to come out of the general budget right, right. so ashley's budget has been very clear on that which has been helpful it's something we're just going to have to continue that trend so anyone else okay so this requires a vote 
uh, next next meeting, Mrs. Cox. Not yet. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Next meeting. Okay, good. 513. Yep. Okay. Reports to committee. We're ready for the reports. And Ashley Lopes. I don't have anything additional. Um, yep. I guess I'll just highlight that our um, custodians are coming back on Monday. Um, DLS has changed their standards on custodial um, being in the buildings. Now we can start preparing for summer cleaning and doing routine maintenance before custodians were only allowed in the building if they were attended to COVID-19 cleaning procedures. Um, as long as we adhere with the guidelines around COVID-19, such as the distancing, um, we can have people in the building. In mass, do you have other PPE? Okay. Yes. All right, Steve Owen. Um, is there any updates for uh, one, I'll say general maintenance project, um, to the FMS report that was out, um, including if there is a, I'm, I'm assuming the answer is no, but let's just put it on the record that we don't have a rescheduled date of com them coming back and reanalyzing that. And three, uh, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the big boiler project, I'll call Performance it. Performance contracting? Another... Yes, Perform. thank you. No problem. So um, some things had to stop due to the closures in COVID-19. Some things were able to continue because they were already scheduled. So for instance, at the middle school, we had in place a project to replace the insulation in the unit ventilators. That happened over um, April break. So that was done last week and it's wrapping up this week. There's a few little things. Um, performance contracting, we executed the contract for the audit and they've been in our buildings conducting the audit. They should be done in the next week or two to be able to present us with the options. And then from there, we have to go into our next contract of what services we're going to move forward with. And then we have to get, secure the funding. Obviously that all comes up in front of the board. So I don't have any additional information to share with you right now, but we had a pretty extensive process with legal going over the last contract. But we're, we're still on the timetable because I know that, and I know there's several other things are in place, but that project was done, it had to be done over the summer. Exactly. Um, but we're still on that timetable, correct? We are, and that's actually, that was included in the energy audit contract that they must be done by October, specifically for the high school, because that was our greatest need. Um, it's We're kind of, I don't want to say lucky, but because the students are not in school, we're not using that boiler as much. We're kind of on a, a, a shut off kind of hold period where there's no one actually entering the building regularly. So we don't have to run it at full capacity. So that boiler is getting a break as we are all at home. Got it, thank you. Mine isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Pat, I think yes. we're, we're ready for you. <laughs> Sorry. So, so I just, I'm gonna give a quick lead in Pat to you. Sure. Um, I have the last ten, seven to 10 days may have been school vacation for some. What I can tell you is the teachers, the principals, and Pat have worked tirelessly to provide you this document and then this enhanced model that you're gonna see in the next two months. So you parents that are uh, board members as well, I think are gonna be equally impressed um, about what's being rolled out, not just for the first four or five weeks, which is Pat's gonna talk about, but what's coming. So with that little, Preface, Pat, I'll turn it to you. Okay, so in an attempt to answer some of the questions that members of the school board had after the last presentation, um, I met with the principals. We wanted to be able to give you a comprehensive look at what actually is going on in every school because it's, it is quite impressive. And also to answer questions like, what do the school counselors do? What do the power professionals do? What are the teacher expectations? What are we asking kids to do? Um, when they participate, what does the participation look like? Um, so I'm hoping that in, in looking at um, the data that the principals gave you, that you feel comfortable with um, the, the level of vibrancy that's going on for learning here. And the key there is, if I may, Pat, is that's phase one. And then right. when and then she'll be speaking about in just a few minutes, phase two as well. Yeah. Right. Pat. So so these documents, so as we had said before, 
we started our remote learning from day one, from March 17th, once they said it, the teachers were all over it. So the plans that I gave to you reflect the phase one guidance, which from the Department of Education was just status quo, you're teaching what they've already learned, and you're just going deeper in that. Now, on Saturday, actually, we received phase three guidance from the Department of Education on what they want learning to look like. So it was a 30 page document that um, I read through a couple of times and created a, um, a summary document for principals and teachers that is only three pages, but includes the salient points. The changes they are making, they are making two changes. <laughs> One is that we're now using, now we're going to create new learning opportunities, so new material moving forward. And the other one is what they call enhanced participation. Everything that was in those 30 pages, this district is already doing, and then some. So when I met with teachers during common planning time, my, my conversations with them was we are tweaking what we're doing, but you are already, you already have structures in place. You already have things going on. We're just going to start adding new learning. For grades one through five, they have the benefit of having iReady. So iReady allows for new learning. Teachers can focus on domains, turn domains off, move kids into certain areas, and iReady will track the participation, how much of those lessons that the kids did, did they actually pass? If they didn't pass it, the algorithm will put them into lessons that will support that learning. So after the teachers come up with the new content areas they wanna teach, they can assess by looking at iReady, the degree that the children actually learned that new skill and concept. For the middle school and the high school, They've created rubrics and everybody is in the process right now of creating remote learning plans that reflect this new guidance. Desi had said to us, take some time, digest this material, but begin creating opportunities for new learning. Another thing that we had done was I reached out to my curriculum leaders and also sent them a document with guidance on how we're going to track all of this new learning. So the, the plan that we've come up with is, there's a spreadsheet that the teachers are all using along with the principal. What we want to know is what standards were taught before school ended on March 13th, which means those standards were taught sitting in front of you, the teacher. And then we spent the last six weeks going deeper on that learning. Now we have eight weeks left and we need to create plans for new standards and, and Desi calls them power standards. So the teachers are determining what new standards these kids really need to know before they go on to the next grade level. Compare those now to the power standards that, that Desi gave to us those standards will now be put into this document that we're keeping. Because what's gonna happen is instructional gaps and curriculum gaps. So when we come back in the fall, whatever that looks like, we're gonna have what we're calling a COVID curriculum. And this spreadsheet is going to really give us a pretty comprehensive look at what standards we think the kids have, are pretty solid on. And the last eight weeks, what standards we probably need to review and what we didn't get at. Desi's guidance is that they fully realize we are not going to be able to teach every standard between now and the end of the school year. That's why we need to be really purposeful in the standards that we pick for the kids to know. And then over the summer, we can determine what those curriculum gaps are and what our instructional strategy is gonna look like. We will also be benchmarking every student as soon as they come into school earlier than we probably would have. We always benchmark at the beginning of the year, but now in order to get a pretty comprehensive look at and a grasp at 
what is sitting in front of teachers now in third, fourth, fifth grade with this whole COVID learning opportunity that they had remotely. Now, where are they and how are we moving forward on that? We've also spoken as admin teams on if we are still doing remote learning next year, what kind of PD do we need to provide to them? Ashley and I have had conversations because along with um, the general funds, there are title funds that I never got to spend. And the state is allowing us to roll a pretty good percentage of those funds into next year. So we can start to look at um, consulting groups like EdTech Teacher Support and, you know, Rick and Ashley and I had started looking at um, Highlander Institute and, and speaking with those people to provide a structure for blended learning, online learning, remote learning platforms that we can buy as a district and then teach teachers how to use those platforms um, for the students. Questions? Any questions on the remote learning plans that yeah. you did receive? Yeah, I have one. Go ahead, Steve. Are these, is the thought that PD would be on the current existing platforms that are currently implemented, such as Google Classroom and Google Meet and how to do that remote piece? Is that what you're referring to? Or are you talking different platforms? Not necessarily, not just Google. So there are other platforms that kids can use like Seesaw, um, Core Atlas, that these ed tech consultants can show us how to use them, but we'd also have to buy them. So that is what I mean by having title funds that we can use to get this support and this PD to teachers. I, I, I would just err on the side of caution on new technology. I'd like to see us focusing on the current technology that we do currently have in place. Um, Cause I think that's gonna be important, especially for September if we're still in this remote learning piece, we won't have a new technology in place for September 1. Right. Uh, so I would just do that. And I will say it's this blended learning that from a technology perspective that should be in the technology plan um, for that. Yep, Jerry. First of all, I wanna thank you very much, Pat, for all of this. This has been very helpful. Um, I am one of the people who's been questioning and only because I feel as though I'm living in the dark right now. I can't really sure. and we understand talk to that. anyone. And right. so at least this gives us an idea. I assume that the two elementary schools are doing the same um, general schedule, the hour of reading, the hour of math. That yes. Yes. Yeah, they they have schedules. Doing. Right. That's right. Yes. And so Desi also gave us some additional guidance on support to parents in that regard. Um, provide checklists for parents, provide a must do schedule so that, you know, those kinds of things that many of the teachers have already been doing, but now uniformly everybody will start doing it based on this, these guidelines. That's part of the learning plans that the principals and teachers are creating now moving forward. Those new um, guidelines for um, new learning will begin Monday, May 4th. So the teachers and principals and I have been working together. I've been part of common planning time meetings to try to get this moving this week for some, some implementation on May 4th to begin new materials. Sherry? Um, that's, that's great. Um, are you planning on utilizing what the commissioner put out as far as why um, a family is not participating. I see that our participation is going up, which is great. Right. But I would really like to see some sort of data that could tell us that of the 18% um, of the people, to students that didn't participate this week, 4% right. of them didn't um, participate because there was no electricity for two days because of the storm. 6% of them were sick. Right. Something like that. Some, so that we have yeah. some idea why they're not. And and my other question is, are you um, are you following those kids that are continually not 
for those families that are continually not yeah. participating. Yes, so part of this next phase that we're putting into, and the principals and I have already talked, is to use, to create school-based teams now as part of this enhanced participation. So on those teams would be the paraprofessionals, my nurse, the school counselor. So those teams will get the names from teachers of families, students who have not participated and the degree they, ha they haven't participated. And so Desi provided us with a script mm -hmm. that, so that it's uniform um, and well-documented that these school-based teams now will reach out to the families and start to track why they're not participating. What can we do to help them participate? And so if it ends up that it's something like, you know, their electricity has been turned off or there's been some significant emotional disturbance within the family, we can try to um, steer some resources that way to help them. Um, what Desi did say was that um, they do not want this to be a punitive type of a thing that, that it, children who cannot participate, that we're reaching out to them to the degree that we can and trying to provide every resource we can to help them participate, um, but that it's not, it's not a punitive conversation with parents. Um, hence the script and also having the school-based team that has a school counselor on it, um, a school nurse, somebody who knows how to have those conversations with parents and knows the appropriate next question to ask when parents are talking to them. Great, thank you. Laura, did I see your hand? Okay, uh, Steve, Sylvia. Yeah, sorry about that. I was, I was just on the, um, do you have any thoughts on uh, the, and thank you, Pat, for, for all you're doing, and thank you to everyone in the leadership team. I mean, this is a, an amazing task to get this up and running. Just comments on, I see a lot of call in, in reaching out, but any any thoughts or, or guidance or uh, recommendations in your plan regard to, to the video sessions or live sessions or the, the virtual office hours and engaging students that way, as opposed to, to calling and saying, you know, why aren't you, you doing stuff? More, more of that real connection, human connection with teachers that, that yes. I think students would benefit from. Yes, so part of our conversations with the teacher teams and, and the principals, you know, leadership teams and I has been also to enhance video recorded lessons so that there is more face-to-face -face interaction virtually with the kids. Also, um, our guidance is that when we're teaching new material, that it is now a recorded opportunity so that kids can go back and look at it again and parents go back and look at it again. It's not a one shot, hey, you missed the nine to 9.30 Zoom thing, sorry about it. You, you, know, you, you have a running record of something. So we had a conversation, um, a couple of the common planning team meetings about creating maybe a slide deck so that there's a permanent documentation of what the new learning material is that kids can go back and refer to and creating um, um, like classroom-based libraries that the kids can, can refer back to and that at least um, three opportunities per week for students and teachers to have interaction like we're having. You can see each other, you can have conversations and then you know, reach out to the school-based team with anybody, even somebody that you're laying eyes on, that you're having a concern about the environment that you see them in. I mean, we can all see each other's environment. I know you're looking at my refrigerator, but you know, for a lot, for a lot of teachers, it's an opportunity to pay attention to how do these kids look now. Um, Steve Owen, did you have a question? Yeah, I just I was just curious that, you know, as is in the private sector, there's going to be some teachers that do that very well. Yes. And then there are some that are not comfortable doing that right. at all. How do we bridge that gap? Right. So so we've again in having conversations with teachers, they've been pretty forthcoming about um they, they're comfortable enough to say 
where they think their weaknesses are in that regard. Um, I have to give a huge shout out to Drew Davey from the high school who has been phenomenal in helping. So, so when I have conversations with teachers or principals and something like that comes up, I'm just not comfortable with using Google Meet. I don't know how, I need a virtual whiteboard. So I contact Drew who will research, come up with a, a short video clip with um, some guided directions on how to do things. We are getting that out to people. I've also reached out to teachers to create an in-house, in-district tech support team. So I wanted the names of the tech savvy people on in each school. And then I reached out to them to say, I got your name. You're very tech savvy. Um, I hear you're a go-to person in this school. Would you be willing to serve voluntarily on this team just for your colleagues in your school? So when they come up and they, they say, I'm just not comfortable with blah, blah, blah. I don't know how to do this. Um, would you be, could you be a go-to person who could help them out? And every single school has somebody, at least one, most two, who have reached out to me to say, absolutely, I would very, be very happy to do that. I think moving forward, what I'd like to do is next year, create a technology curriculum leader position, yes. because I think that's going to be important moving forward, especially to have somebody they're comfortable with. So it needs to be a colleague that's got social capital in that people see them as a knowledgeable person yeah, that they can approach. Um, and so those are kind of some of the plans that we're thinking about long term, but right now trying to get the support to teachers that they need. They've done an unbelievable job trying to learn this stuff on their own. Um, Desi also recommends, and we've had conversations about working together as teams now. So divide the work up. Mm -hmm. Somebody take one of the new content areas. Somebody do geometry and then give that to your whole team. Someone else is going to take punctuation. And, you know, so rather than everyone's trying to create six new learning opportunities, divide the wealth and as a team, send this out and, and take some of the pressure off the teachers. We're hoping mm -hmm. that these school-based teams that will reach out to parents also will start to take some of the pressure off of teachers. Teachers are, of course, the first line of defense. They'll reach yep, out right. first to say, you know, hey, honey, what happened? Why did you not show up? But right. if it's right. chronic and we're tracking who's chronic, we've been doing that. Yep, I now, appreciate now that. the teams will get involved. So yeah. I have Rick and then I have Steve Sylvia again. So, so the quick answer to that, Pat, Pat just shared, Steve, is there's not an opt out, Steve. <laughs> um, we're going we're gonna to get more no. consistent here right. we, we built supports in yes. you're going to see a more comprehensive plan more consistent plan and in some instances teachers are already spot on on this those individuals in the enhanced plans in the next couple of weeks um, the expectations are there and people have embraced it and so in those instances yes. that people are struggling uh, or in those instances where maybe your children have not been exposed in a certain classroom you are going to see greater exposure relative to that based on supports we've built in, but it will not be an answer. And, and, and we haven't had any pushback on this that I'm, I'm simply not comfortable. So I'm choosing right. to do something different. I think you're going to see much more of that um, in the next couple of months across the board. Thanks, Thank Gene. You. Still Steve Sylvia. Yeah, and I think my point was an emphasis more on meaningful connections as opposed right. to, the outreach of, hey, what happened? Or, hey, where, where, where have you been? I, I think a lot of these kids are just starving for connections that are, again, meaningful and think going that way. I mean, as you move to the end of the year, I'm sure you're already having conversations about what report cards may look like. Yes, and, we are. You know, are. That, that, that in its own, um, that's yes. the whole other uh, mm. section of, of a conversation. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, but we have started those conversations too. And some teachers will actually go to a home. I know um, Dr. Sullivan went to somebody's home to make sure that, you know, they were doing well and, and to drop off some stuff for them. Yeah, so there I, is that outreach already. And that, you know what, that, I'm glad you said that because I, as this continues and anxiety and stress levels increase for so many folks, 
I, I would hope that we wouldn't be hesitant to take the next step if that were necessary. Right. That's Absolutely. a scary time for people. Yes. Uh, yes, it is. It is. Um, okay, Steve Owen. Um, this can be answered with a, a very simple yes, but um, in the unfortunate experience that one of our teachers is diagnosed with this, is there a plan from a coverage perspective? Yes. Guidelines. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's not going to work. It doesn't happen, but we've got a plan for it. Thank no, you. we definitely need to be prepared for that. We have had leaves of absence other than COVID that, that we've had to make adjustments on, and we, mm -hmm. we are prepared, correct? Well, the, the guidelines are clear. We, we should know what we have to do. Anyone yeah. who, yeah, so, so, but it's still good for people to understand that you'll be Just, following those guidelines. Yes, see, Rick. Fox, I'm going to put, I'm going to put Dr. Kablinski on the spot before she wraps <laughs> up and we go to special education, mm -hmm. but I'm going to put you on the clock. This is like the NFL draft, Pat. You got two minutes to give a quick brief highlight on PD because we had an exciting event yesterday oh, that yes. Pat facilitated that I just want to at least make sure people hear about, even if it's a short snippet. So, Teachers came back from vacation to face more work, more information, more guidelines, teach new things. So we wanted to provide a professional development opportunity that was just for teachers, something good for them that would be inspiring and motivating to get them through the next nine weeks of remote learning, um, have a few laughs. So our opening day speaker was Pam Garamone, and she's a, um, she does uh, positive psychology, and she was great. We laughed for the whole rest of the day, and, and people took that with them. So we brought her back for an encore performance yesterday afternoon. We had 288 staff people log in. We Zoomed it. Um, Ashley was a huge, huge help in um, the technological piece also, and, and her and I, Ashley and I met with Pam um, the day before to get her through how to Zoom. Um, I was amazed that I even had the answers to some of those questions, but I also had backup from Ashley, so, so that, was, that was great. Um, so we took her through how to do all of that, and then um, we held the pro professional development presentation yesterday afternoon. People were responding during chat, you know, the chat pot, so you could see it ongoing, yeah. um, the engagement that people were in. And then honestly, Rick and I were flooded with emails and feedback as soon as they hung up on, on how jazzed people felt about having that opportunity to just reconnect and this is why we're in this and you've got the support and it's going to be fine and we've got this and it was... It was it was very heartwarming actually to to be a part of. I was I was really happy that we were able to do that and that teachers really enjoyed it as much as they did. Thanks, Pat. Oh, that's great. That's great. Hey, Will, that's Will, do you have a question? Yeah, Will, I saw your hand. You're on mute. You're muted. Okay, I was good. just stretching. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I knew that. Oh, there'll be none of that. <laughs> so, so Pat, thank you very much for everything you put together. I would like to come back at some point and talk more about the standards piece that you talked about. That's a yes. little concerning to me. Um, you know, when somebody says we're not gonna be able to do it all, which we all knew, um, right. I just would like to have a little bit more data on, on what we're looking at not being able to do. We can get back to you yeah, on that, and, Yeah, I can definitely provide you with what the power standards are that um, Desi is recommending and what our teachers are saying that they're going to do moving forward because we're documenting all of that. Um, so we will make sure that it's important learning only because teachers want to make sure that the teacher receiving the kids has a good opportunity to hit the ground running in, in the fall Agreed. for whatever that will look like. Thank you. But yes, that's, that's being tracked and will be well documented. Thank I'm happy you. to share that. I have Steve and Steve. Steve Owen, you were first. Pat, you mentioned 288. 288 out of how many? Well, we have 231 teachers, teachers. and then um, I think 80 paraprofessionals. Okay. So we were expecting around 300. So 288 was what we saw log in. Got it. Thank you. 
That's great. Steve Sylvia. Uh, oh, there I am. Yeah. Um, just a, a question on the standards that maybe for the next meeting, but is there a coordination of the standards that you're pushing out from the main office? So, you know, across all grade levels, the teachers are on their own picking from that state document. And, you know, maybe there should be some consistency on what they're addressing every week and then sort of in an effort to minimize the regression when we start back up in the fall and hope it's something that could be normal. Yeah. Right. So the, I'm sure you, you've probably seen the, the power standards that DESE is, is planning, is, yes. is guiding us towards. So the spreadsheet that we are creating, the curriculum leaders are, are part of this, having conversations with teachers about what they think is essential for learning for next year. I am part of the conversations, but I am not dictating to them what they need to teach beyond what Desi is saying they want to see each grade level to be able to do. So in looking at those power standards, we know we have enough time to do at least those at the very minimum. So what I want to know from teachers is, okay, beyond those power standards, now what do you think is an additional piece? What standards do you think we can um, address in the next eight weeks moving forward? And then, and we're having conversations about that. So it's principals, curriculum leaders, teachers, and myself to okay. determine where, you know, where, our learning is going moving forward with an eye on what is this going to look like in the fall and how much regrouping do we have to do? Great. Thank and you. Steve, so, the driving force behind that. Sorry, Gene, the driving force behind that, making sure we're this, this consistency, Steve, to your point. Thanks. Yep. We need that. So I see Derek has his hand up. I didn't know if Bob had a question too, if he did, if you could chime in and we'll, we'll do Derek first. Hey, Rick uh, and Pat. Any um, discussion of how this is all going to play into MCAS? Yeah, <laughs> I I can speak well. well yeah, I can, yeah, I can I can speak I can to that speak first, to that first, Eric. Yeah. Um, obviously, um, I think I that's going to be a real uh, a real question, right? I think what I think with those gaps that are going to come across across the Commonwealth, I think we're going to have to re reevaluate and look at a different assessment uh, at all levels. And the state's not prepared to do so yet, but that it, it absolutely will have an impact on next year. Uh, that's what I kind of figured long before this all began, but um, there, there's just no way to, to continue that. Uh, Correct. Correct. No. There's no way. So, so Bob, did you have a question? Well, it was answered. I was just going to ask what was what's the next eight weeks going to going to be like. Um, yeah. So, good. So, G so Gene, yeah. So I mean, to answer to Bob's question and Derek, I, you know, I think the commissioner. I mean, there was a question. Some superintendents have actually pushed: Should we even be doing MCAS next year? And we and kind of recalibrate the whole piece. He obviously was not prepared to make that determination. Remember, federal monies um, rely on that assessment. So I think he basically said it's a little early, um, but it certainly is going to have an impact. So stay tuned on that. Thank you. Okay. Does that answer your question, Bob? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else before we move on to Liz? Can so if, if there is more information that people need, I'd be happy, if you email me, I'd be happy to share whatever it is, just so you have a very clear picture of, honestly, how awesome these teachers are and, and the, the high degree of learning that's going on in this well, district. Well, thank you for that, Pat, because yes, there's been a lot of concern and, and I'm sure you've heard it, that the concern is, is consistency, is participation, is what kind of learning are we gonna see? What, what, are, what is every staff member doing? What are they contributing to make sure we give as robust a program right. as we can offer remotely? And then, you know, lessons learned and best practices. We need to isolate those and figure out because we're gonna be doing this. This is not going yeah. away. Yeah, we um, think so too. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's, I think it's a done deal. We're, we're, it's going to be a hybrid of some sort, but it will probably happen. So yeah, and I did have a couple of questions I didn't want to belabor the meeting on. I'll just email them to you. I'm sure they're yes. quick and easy. So thank Please. you for that. Please do, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Liz? So, Liz. Liz. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> so um, our special ed services and team meetings are in full swing and running smoothly based on the updated DESE guidance 
two special ed directors to date. Um, you'll, re you'll recall that um, special ed moved toward addressing student IEP goals um, sooner than the second round of enhancements. So uh, we've been doing this for about the week of March 23rd. Uh, we've had a service delivery and, and addressing student specific IEP services um, since that time. I included in your packet uh, the memo and the procedural manual that I um, drafted and developed for our teachers and related service providers during remote, um, extended remote learning time. And uh, it's really a, a comprehensive look at where we are in the status of special education in the district. Um, and as you can see when you skim through that I have tried to make the procedural aspects of the job as easy and straightforward as possible for staff so that that is not an added um, concern for them. Everything is essentially done for them to, to edit to their specific um, cases and students. The, um, the next DESE State Special Ed Directors Meeting is this Friday, May 1st um, at 11. So we will certainly be looking for any updated guidance that they have to share. Personally, I don't think there's gonna be anything um, terribly new substantively because we've got a pretty good um, statewide plan and district plan going forward. Um, the, the outstanding issues, if you will, that we are addressing, and I'm actually meeting with Meredith and Ashley um, and my, my Office of Student Service team on Friday afternoon following that meeting. So the um, outstanding issues, what we'll be working on is um, addressing the transition meetings for students that are gonna be moving up a level to a school. Those will be happening remotely um, as best possible and including both of the schools. Of course, the extended school year. So uh, we will definitely be running um, a, remote, um, a remote ESY component absent the, the, the green light, which um, you know, we don't expect at this time. And then to, to Laura's point, um, a discussion on the individual students and the services that they may need to recoup any um, lost skills or significant skills that we have um, going forward. So we're gonna be talking about all of those things in the next you know, week to two weeks um, and hashing those pieces out. Um, Okay. Should I take questions, Thank Steve? You. Yep. So Steve Owen has a question. You're on mute, Steve. Steve, Steve, you're muted. Sure. There's a number of people that would like to have me muted, but um, <laughs> the question: there is plan going to the next year that we had some students that would be graduating out. Um, that was prior to what we're facing now. Um, is there any current change to those numbers that it would actually have a budget impact? Are you talking about students who are, are graduating or students who are um, aging out for eligibility? Uh, I, don't, I don't think the aging out would have an issue, but I think the graduation piece that, um, my question is there was a budget plan that there would be students that were being no longer require our services within the district based upon what we're experiencing now, is there a change to those numbers that would actually have an impact on a budget that wasn't planned for? Um, that, that's a hard question in the way you're asking it. Um, I don't think in the, in the leave, do you mean ac graduating with a diploma or do you mean just exiting special ed? Because we've had those meetings and we review students' plans for 10 months of the year. So we have had the, the vast majority of meetings through March 16th. No, I, I, and I apologize if I'm not asking the, the question in a clear manner. I just would like to make sure that uh, we budget for a particular number and part of that budget assumptions were students that would no longer require our services in FY21. Um, are we seeing any change to date or something we have to keep track of that they would still need our services in FY21 even though we thought they originally didn't need it. Is that not, make it Yeah, clear? not based on the budget planning. Certainly, I, I share your concern with, um, you know, students that may require more level of support and more services based on this, um, this situation that we found ourselves in, but not, not really the way, no, not the way you're asking it. Those plans 
um, are, are, we're fairly set. Okay, thank you. Steve, we meet regularly, um, at least once a month. I meet with Liz and her team and we go over all of those out of district placements. So we have a list of kids who are aging out that we know we don't need to budget for them next year. And then we have our second tier of kids who um, are on the cusp of graduation, but we don't necessarily remove those tuitions until we know they're graduating in June. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have, as the out of district chair, as you know, so I've, I've been doing my own team meetings and sitting in on that and I've coordinated with all of our students who are in out of district placements and there's been no change that a student was going to graduate or, or, you know, go on or not require a service. Um, there's been no financial um, implication with respect to that. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, Sylvia. Still mute. We had talked about referrals in past meetings when we were in session. I would imagine that those just get bumped to the fall um, at this point, and, and there'll be, you know, a, a number of, of opportunities to be testing in the fall, which, which um, you know, for staffing and, and impact reasons on direct services could be impacted. I assume you obviously thought of that. Yes, absolutely. Um, we, we're not doing those initial evaluations until we have the students in, in front of us. Um, there was some chatter on the state site about um, concerns. Well, could you do these remotely? And then the overarching guidance was that could possibly, you know, lend itself to claims that it, it wasn't procedurally valid and then, you know, have huge influx for requests for independent evaluations. Um, and, and really, this, the students being evaluated right now, it, it's a time of crisis. I don't know if, if that would be the best snapshot, even if that was possible to do at this time. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. I agree. And thank you for being on top of that. I just, my fear is when we get back to some level of normal is, is direct services to kids as we play catch up. Um, right. Absolutely. And, and as I said, and, and to Laura's point, it, it's not that, um, I, I just want to be clear when we're, we're thinking and planning about this, you know, extended school year is extended school year. You know, if we wanted to do some other iteration of a summer academy, it just wouldn't be extended school year. So like I said, um, everyone in the state is hoping that the DESE provides more guidance re regarding ESY on Friday. Um, and then, you know, we will meet and have a, a discussion after that, a virtual meeting. Thank you, Laura. Where are we um, with relation to contract services and the budget? I, I don't know if they're being provided now or it, certainly not in the oh. same way necessarily. Have, have there been savings there or have they? there been more expenditures than we expected? So for the, the um, direct service contracted services, all of those um, providers, not that we have, we, we don't have that many, are working virtually um, with the students. So that has, has remained. We have students um, who are receiving um, those types of services as part of their remote learning plan for the school that they, they attend, or if they, uh, we have a couple of homebound students that they are being attended to um, as best possible with the remote learning. Does that answer your question, Laura? Yeah, I just didn't know if there were um, any yeah. changes based on the fact that maybe they couldn't provide services or, or even if students may not have been available for services. Right. But the department's guidance is to pay for all services that are being rendered, um, even if it's in a virtual capacity. So what we need to do is have documentation from those service providers that of what they're providing those kids. That also relates back to circuit breaker and our reimbursement at the end of the year. So it's very important that it's documented, even with the out of district tuitions. So there are some districts in the state that are not paying those contracted services because they're not receiving them. But to date, we are as a district, so we're still paying them. Yeah, and, and given our proximity, it, it's, it's important that, um, that those commitments are, are honored, honored in you know, conjunction with the services that they provide because we really rely on those schools and providers. And if we didn't have them, we would, we would have other problems on our hands in terms of being able to provide services for you know, pockets of students. Rick. Thank you, Liz. Oh, you didn't want to say 
Any, anything else for Liz? This is another area that's very scary for everyone. So I hope you get some guidance on Friday. It's, it's just tough with a certain subgroups to do this remote learning. And so I'm hearing a lot of concern and I'm sure you are as well um, about quantity, quality and, and applicability, um, all of that. Oh, Sherry had a question. Liz, have you been in touch when, with any of the families to find out how things are going at home, you or? Um, yes, so I have a caseload of um, probably about 50 students that um, I am in direct contact with. So I am actually the liaison for all of them. In terms of um, at the five, at our five school sites, Ma uh, Meredith and Ashley have been sort of the family, you know, the teachers, uh, guidance counselors, and, and um, Meredith or Ashley has been the lead on that. But no, I have, I, I've personally been in contact with all of um, my out of district families. And they've been in contact with all of their in district. Is that right? Well, not all of them. I mean, they have made outreach, right? There have been situations to make outreach. Um, if, if certain mechanisms of outreach hadn't worked, so that we, we've enlisted the principals and then, you know, Meredith or Ashley to, to encourage the remote learning and troubleshoot any problems. So they have not made outreach to every single one of our families if there's been no issues, but certainly in, in cases which required more attention, um, that has been attended to. I'm not trying to overrule you in any way, but sometimes we're not sure if there's any problems there unless someone does that outreach. Right. Especially with so those. Our, so, sorry. So our but we've had actually robust special ed individual school based special ed department meetings since this this first happened. And you know, so every week I'm I'm hearing to, the meetings have you know gone anywhere from 30 minutes to. Uh, two hours. So we're actually talking about families in need and we're actually having those communications. Um, you know, we're, we're hearing if, you know, who's, who they might be concerned about teachers in terms of um, participation and we're making a plan for there. So we've addressed uh, with every single teacher at every school, any special ed um, issues and access and concerns that, that have come up. Thank you, Rick. Gene, I was just going to add to what Liz said. In fact, in many ways, Sherry and, and others, the SPED department was really leading the charge relative to modeling um, some of the good practices you're going to see in the enhanced plans relative to this communication. It's, um, and again, that's what we want, all want to hear, right? Because this is our most needy group and population and, and needed those services. So we've been real pleased with the cooperation, but the outreach will continue and certainly that cohesive group that meets regularly. I mean, the regular ed teachers now from a consistent basis will jump on to what special education teachers really have done from day one almost really. So that's a credit to that department, but thank you, Jean. All right, well, thank you. So I'm looking at the clock and I'm trying to yep. be respectful of everyone's time. We have um, Old Colony uh, and the Freetown issue, which is, um, I guess, Mr. Medeiros, you're gonna be addressing that? Correct. Yeah. So I wish I was, uh, it looks like the last topic other than uh, other business. Um, and I wish I had better news to share with you um, in relation to this. And, and the Freetown board members, Will Sankiewicz specifically, Gene and Derek, have really played an integral part with Bob um, in, in collaboration with the town of Freetown. I'll try to keep, keep this short. I've provided you in your packet the letter that Mrs. Pacheco, the board chair, sent to two, two regional districts. So quick snapshot as best I can, and I know the board members have some, some real strong comments in relation. We have 43 applications from our incoming class, our eighth graders to go be freshmen. We typically have about 20 students that attend and are accepted. 31 of those 41 up, 43 applications qualified a relatively high standard, a higher standard than Old Colony normally had, and this year we had zero accepted. We from did not- Freetown. Just from, from Freetown. Freetown, right? This is all Freetown. 43 applications from Freetown, 31 qualified, zero accepted. We all know, and it's been, and we're talking 40 years of a history and relationship with Old Colony. We now have sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Um, we have reached out to the state. We have reached out to the, to the, the administration at Old Colony, um, attended meetings with Old Colony and the Board of Selectmen. 
and and really it looks like we have no alternative for that current class, although we're not done uh, fighting for them at this point. Uh, but it looks like for this current class, so I do know the town of Freetown through the Board of Selectmen, which is the appropriate piece, is not only looking at membership for Old Colony, but also for Bristol Plymouth, which they remain uh, original members, by the way, with Bristol Plymouth. So there would be no buy-in potentially to that uh, and seeing what uh, vocational options are. But I wanted to bring it to the whole board's attention because we do obviously have all our Lakeville students attend. The process just was a lousy process quite candidly for the kids and the families involved. And I'm disappointed uh, for those children, quite frankly. Selfishly, I have to say, those talented kids probably end up at a Poniquit and I'll gladly take them back. There are kids, but it's really a shame. And I know Will and, yeah. and some of the board it members probably awful. have some questions. We wanted yeah. to put it on the topic because I know this. Yes, so uh, Will. Yeah, I mean, Rick, I think you hit the nail on the head. Just, just really, really just upsetting for me. And I think the longer this thing is dragged out and the more I've thought about it, the more it doesn't sit well um, with me. Just, just about how these three town students were, were treated. Um, I just, at the end of the day, I don't think it was right. Um, so I'm happy that the, the board is, has taken the steps moving forward to kind of research all avenues. Um, because at the end of the day, we need our Freetown students to, get, to obviously be able to land in a spot that's best for them. Um, and Old Colony ha had been that for us, right? So um, I just, hopefully moving forward, I think Old Colony needs us um, just as bad as we need them. But if not, I'm, I'm certainly happy that, that the board is reaching out and looking at other avenues because um, this just doesn't sit well with me. And, and I don't think our, our, our students should be treated no. this way. So it, it, it was very un, almost unethical. I don't think there's any other way to put it. Yeah, we yeah. never, we missed, we didn't take our bite at the apple when we should have, but yeah. that's never been an issue. They've taken our money every year. And this will probably have a negative impact on the other member communities assessments as well. So yes, the board is being proactive. I don't. I think they agree that Old Colony's been very much a part of our culture for a long time. We have our Lakeville brothers and sisters that go there, and um, you know you'd like to have that. But they they are they're they're definitely opening up opportunities. So it's unfortunate, but yeah, as as Mr. Madeira says, a Poniquit welcomes them. Uh, and I'll and I'll continue to keep the board updated through the board membership here relative to what options are available to those students um, and, and see if, in fact, we can potentially request a waiver um, in relation. They do have a capacity issue, but they knew that all along and yeah. it's never been an issue previous. So um, we'll I'll continue to keep this board updated if I think some formal action needs to be taken by this board in relation to votes. I will certainly bring that forward with recommendations. I think the town of Freetown will, Gene, I think you can speak to this. I think the town of the Freetown, the Board of Selectmen feel very much supported by this school committee and the mm -hmm. school board. And if we could take, if we need to take some formal action to so show support in voting uh, capacity, I will bring those recommendations forward. Thanks. Thank you. So I have Derek and I have Steve Owen. Derek, you're on mute. I'm going to take a minute to jump on my soapbox here, but I've been saying for years, love to see trades back into our schools. Um, love to see, you know, certainly a pandemic like this should reshape and re have us relook at our private, our public education system. Um, the old days of shop wouldn't be so bad in a public school system. Um, anyways, um, outside of that, Rick, my question to you would be, is there opportunity to choice into a vocational school? So, so, if I may. So I, and Will knows this, G knows this. I, immediately when I, when I heard from the superintendent, this wasn't an option. I reached out to Diamond Regional, Greater New Bedford, Bulk, Bristol, and the problem is they're all at capacity and they are all with waiting lists for their members. So yeah. the answer is yes, but they have re member residents waiting. And so the only one that was considering a potential, potential tuition um, for one year transition was Bristol Plymouth and they're still open to that. So there is a potential, but, but to, to your point, yes, but the problem is that they just don't have the slots available. But Derek, um, the, the superintendent at Bristol Plymouth is Magalhaes and his wife used to be on our school committee. Just saying. 
and, and so, yes, there's still, but we're, we're keeping that option open, Derek. Yes, Steve Owen. Uh, Rick, just as a point of clarification, and I'm, is it fair to say that you've expressed your disappointment on behalf of our students to your counterpart at Old Colony on the lack of uh, mm -hmm. expectation, if you will, um, they knew they hit this 300 number long before the interviews or what have you. And I think that's where hearing from parents is, is one of the biggest frustration uh, is the lack of expectations being set. I, I have on multiple venues <laughs> Great, um, expressed, expressed that displeasure. Thank you. I think Mr. I think Clark, Clark also had a question. Oh, yes, Bob. What's the rationale that, they, that they're using, that they don't have any slots? Is that the, that's the rationale? Yes. Yes, yes, yes but Bob. They, so, but so they dragged everyone along, though. They made everyone fill out the application, go through the process, and even though they knew they were going to be with these kids, they were already at capacity, it was, it was really not well played. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I see Will has his hand up. Yeah, not to be spiteful or, or vindictive, um, but just I just yeah, we need to think about moving forward too. They have they have a building project that they desperately want um, to fund, and and having Freetown as a member district will certainly help them with that process. Um, so, I mean, one hand washes the other. So I think that needs to be part of the conversation moving forward, um, as far as the towns go. But they they already know that. Um, and and Rick, you you've been more than um, blunt with with how disappointed you are and i and i certainly appreciate that message coming from you so so thank you very much thanks and thank I, I echo that uh you have been and then you've kept us all in the loop about how we can communicate and our board's been very grateful to your point we've been thanked for that support so um thank you for that update um does anybody else have anything uh, oh steve i'm sorry just a question i know we are unique in many different facets <laughs> Are there any other regional school districts that fall into this category where certain member towns are members and other members are not? You know what I mean? It's just, uh, it seems like a strange occurrence. I don't know of any that fall into that. I just didn't know, especially when we went into the regional discussion, if this was brought up there too. But, um, and I know that's outside of our focus point, it's usually the towns that have to vote for that. I was just curious if there's any other regional districts or where we're that fall into the unfortunate circumstance that we're in. Um, Steve, I'm not aware of, of other districts. Most of the regional districts are in Western Mass and, and you know, obviously all inclusive into one collaborative. But um, uh, so, so the quick answer is I'm not aware. Did we have anyone go to Aggie? We do have a small percentage every year that does attend um, Bristol Agricultural, but it's a program piece. And Derek, to your to your request about vocational schools going back to the public schools, if the state and the commissioner would like to give me the amount of money that they're rolling into those vocational schools to build chapter 74, I will gladly build those programs. And for our kids, they'll come, right? I mean, so the money that's rolling in, and I'm not, it's not a criticism, but it's the truth, to those vocational schools, um, just drive by them. Bristol Aggie's building right now. Both Bristol Plymouth and Old County want to build. And so they're looking for enrollment. And so, um, again, you got to look at capacity, though, and you got to look at what, it, what our programs would look like. And unless we had significant funding from the state, and it's why they went to this model, um, you wouldn't be able to mirror what the vocational schools had. But um, well, I, I, I do will, think. I will say, Dighton Rehoboth does a pretty good job. Yeah, Dighton, Dighton Rehoboth kids, by the way, are members of Bristol Plymouth. Uh, but they have a lot in the high school, too. Yeah, they, they have. They all they the have audio, retained. video, all of that's there. They do, they, they, so some comprehensive high schools do incorporate some of this stuff. But I hear you, you need the money. Yeah. And Mrs. Fox, I would, I would concur with what some of the other board members said. In light of what we've been dealing with, I would think uh, media production and technology uh, might take off these days relative to that. I know I could uh, use someone sitting alongside me on a daily basis. So me too. Stay tuned me too. There. So if there's no other business, I would just like to put out for everybody to consider since all of the elections are way down the road and I've overstepped my uh, welcome here as chair, it, we should consider a reorg. Uh, I know other boards have done that. 
Um, but my year is up. And so maybe at the next meeting, we could do that if, if that's if everyone's amenable. Sherry. So when um, is the election or how many meetings do we have before the election? I think late the election. It's not going to happen. Is the 16th. Well, um, actually, Jean, I just checked my email a minute ago, and the town of Lakeville has sent out. I know I didn't. Uh, annual town election, January, June 16th, 2020, COVID 19. Early voting by mail is available. All right. So, uh, maybe it's not going to happen, but as of 3 26 this afternoon, it was happening. <laughs> I think we have three meetings between now and then. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm just, I, just putting it out there. I mean, the, a lot of the boards have done the reorg. It's not the the way we function, and I functioned with Carolyn before. I mean, I find that the chair and the vice chair tend to do an awful lot of communication and coordinating. It's almost a co-chair kind of capacity. So, um, you know, I'm comfortable moving on. <laughs> um, yes, Derek, making you. I'm gonna nominate you. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. I wouldn't have an issue with that. The only thing is with elections, I would say then you'd hold off on the subcommittee reorder yes. because of the, you know, the changes there. But at the board level, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Perfect. So, so we'll put that on the agenda for the next meeting. I'll be May 13th. Yep. Is there any other business that may properly come before this board? Then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second. Second. Great. I'm sure there's no discussion, so let's do the roll. <laughs> Jean Fox. Yes. Steve Owen. Yes. Sherry Barron. Yes. Bob Clark. Yes. Derek Gracia. Yes. Laura Ramsden. Yes. Will Sankowitz. Yes. Steve Sylvia. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you so Jean, much. Just for clarification, I know Sherry seconded. Who made the motion? I'm sorry. Who? Derek Who? Gracia. Yeah, Derek. Derek Gracia. Thank Good you. Point. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Yep. You Thank too. you. Thank you, Derek.